Mali was dead. To begin with, there is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clerk, the clergyman, the undertaker, the chief mourner, Scrooge, signed it. Old Marley was dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead. Of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Though Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood years afterwards above the warehouse door. Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge, Scrooge, and sometimes Marley, but he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck generous fire, secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. He carried his own low temperature always about with him. He iced his office in the dog days, and he didn't thaw it one degree at Christmas. External heat and cold had little influence on Scrooge. No warmth could warm, nor wintry weather chill him. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say, My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was a clock. Even the blind men's dogs appeared to know him, and when they saw him coming would tug their owners into doorways and up courts. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked. To edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance. Once upon a time, and of all the good days in the year, on Christmas Eve, Old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather, foggy with all, and he could hear the people in the court outside go wheezing up and down, beating their hands upon their breasts and stamping their feet upon the pavement stones to warm them. The city clocks had only just gone three, but it was quite dark already. The fog came pouring in at every chink and keyhole, and was so dense without, the houses opposite were mere phantoms. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open, that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who, in a dismal little cell beyond, a sort of tank, was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire. But the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal. But he couldn't replenish it, for Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room. And so surely as the clerk came in with the shovel, the master predicted that it would be necessary for them to part. Whereupon the clerk put on his white comforter and tried to warm himself at the candle, in which effort, not being a man of strong imagination, he failed. A Merry Christmas, Uncle! It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew, who came upon him so quickly that this was the first intimation he had of his approach. He had so heated himself with rapid walking in the fog and the frost, this nephew of Scrooge's, that he was all in a glow. His face was ruddy and handsome, and his eyes sparkled. Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! Ah, said Scrooge. Humbug! Christmas a humbug, Uncle? You don't mean that, I'm sure. I do. Merry Christmas. Oh, don't be cross, Uncle. What else can I be when I live in such a world of fools as this? Merry Christmas. Out upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer? If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Uncle, nephew, 
keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it. Come, dine with us tomorrow. I'll see you in hell first. But why? Why? Good afternoon. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon. Well, I'm sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute. But I'll keep my Christmas humour to the last. So, Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. His nephew left the room, but stopped at the outer door to bestow the greetings of the season on the clerk, who, cold as he was, was warmer than Scrooge, for he returned them cordially. There's another fellow, my clerk, with fifteen shillings a week and a wife and family, talking about a Merry Christmas, I'll retire to Bedlam. The clerk in letting Scrooge's nephew out, had let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands, and they bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years, said Scrooge. He died... Seven years ago, this very night. We have no doubt his liberality is well represented by his surviving partner. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries, and hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts, sir. Are there no prisons? Oh, plenty of prisons. And the Union workhouses, are they still in operation? Oh, they are still. I, I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigour, then. Both very busy, sir. Oh, I was afraid from what you said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their usual course. I'm very glad to hear it. Under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body to the multitude, a few of us, Mr. Scrooge, are endeavouring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall we put you down for? Nothing. You wish to be anonymous. I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. But uh, many can't go there, Mr. Scrooge, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Seeing clearly that it would be useless to pursue their point, the gentleman withdrew. Scrooge resumed his labours with an improved opinion of himself. And the fog and the darkness thickened. Thickened so that people ran about with flaring links, proffering their services to go before horses in carriages and conduct them on their way. The ancient tower of a church, whose gruff old bell was always peeping slyly down at Scrooge out of a gothic window in the wall, became invisible and struck the hours and quarters in the clouds with tremulous vibrations afterwards, as if its teeth were chattering in its frozen head up there. The cold became intense. In the main street at the corner of the court, some labourers were repairing the gas pipes and had lighted a great fire in a brazier, round which a party of ragged men and boys were gathered, warming their hands and winking their eyes before the blaze in rapture. Foggier yet, and colder, piercing, searching, biting cold. The owner of a scant young nose gnawed by the hungry cold as bones are gnawed by dogs, stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole to regale him with a Christmas carol. 
God bless you, Mary Gentleman, may nothing you dismay. Remember, Scrooge seized the ruler with such energy of action that the singer fled in terror, leaving the keyhole to the fog and even more congenial frost. At length, the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge dismounted from his stool and tacitly admitted the fact to the expectant clerk in the tank, who instantly snuffed his candle out and put on his hat. You will want all day tomorrow, I suppose? Oh, uh, if quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. And yet you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's only once a year a poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. The clerk promised that he would, and, buttoning his greatcoat to the chin, Scrooge walked out. The office was closed in a twinkling, and the clerk, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no greatcoat, went down a slide on Cornhill at the end of a lane of boys twenty times in honour of its being Christmas Eve, and then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt to play at Blind Man's Bluff. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern and having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms in the lowering pile of a building up a yard, where it had so little business to be that one could scarcely help fancying it must have run there when it was a young house, playing at hide-and-seek with other houses, and have forgotten the way out again. It was old enough now, and dreary enough, for nobody lived in it but Scrooge, the other rooms being all let out as offices. Now, it is a fact that there was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door, except that it was very large. It is also a fact that Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his whole residence in that place. Also that Scrooge had as little of what is called fancy about him as any man in the city of London. Let it also be borne in mind that Scrooge had not bestowed one thought on Marley since his last mention of his seven years dead partner that afternoon. And then... Let any man explain to me, if he can, how it happened that Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, without its undergoing any intermediate process of change, not a knocker, but... <gasps> Marley's face! Marley's face. It was not in impenetrable shadow as the other objects in the yard were, but had a dismal light about it, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. It was not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up upon its ghostly forehead. The hair was curiously stirred as if by breath or hot air, and though the eyes were wide open, they were perfectly motionless. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again. To say that he was not startled would be untrue, but he put his hand upon the key he had relinquished, turned it sturdily, walked in, and lighted his candle. He did pause with a moment's irresolution before he shut the door, and he did look cautiously behind it first, as if he half expected the sight of Marley's pigtail sticking out into the hall. But there was nothing on the back of the door except the screws and nuts that held the knocker on. So he said, Bah! and closed it with a bang. The sound resounded through the house like thunder. Every room above and every cask in the wine merchant's cellars below appeared to have a separate peal of echoes of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door and walked across the hall and up the stairs, slowly, too, trimming his candle as he went, for it was pretty dark. But up Scrooge went, not caring a button for that. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. 
but before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, nobody. Nobody in the closet. Nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in. Double locked himself in, which was not his custom. Thus, secured against surprise, he took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap, and sat down before the fire to take his gruel. It was a very low fire indeed, nothing on such a bitter night. He was obliged to sit close to it and brood over it before he could extract the least sensation of warmth from such a handful of fuel. The fireplace was an old one, built by some Dutch merchant long ago, and paved all round with quaint Dutch tiles. But if each smooth tile had been a blank at first, now there was a copy of old Marley's head on every one. Ah, uh, hum! <gasps> Scrooge's glance happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell that hung in the room and communicated for some purpose now forgotten with a chamber in the highest story of the building. It was with great astonishment and with a strange, inexplicable dread that as he looked, he saw this bell begin to swing. Glang, 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 glang. It swung so softly in the outset that it scarcely made a sound. Glang, 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 glang. But soon it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. Glang, 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 glang. This might have lasted half a minute or a minute, but it seemed like an hour. Glang, 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 glang. The bells ceased as they had begun, together. They were succeeded by a clanking noise deep down below, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the casks in the wine merchant's cellar. Scrooge then remembered to have heard that ghosts in haunted houses were described as dragging chains. He heard the cellar door fly open with a booming sound, and then the noise much louder on the floors below, then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards his door. Uh, it's humbug still. I, I won't believe it. His color changed, though, when, without a pause, it came on through the heavy door and passed into the room before his eyes. Upon its coming in, the dying flame leapt up as though it cried, I know him, Marley's ghost! The same face, the very same, Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots, the tassels on the latter bristling like his pigtail, and his coat skirts, and the hair upon his head. The chain he drew was clasped about his middle. It was long and wound about him like a tail, and it was made, for Scrooge observed it closely, of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent, so that Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no bowels, but he had never believed it until now. No, nor did he believe it even now, though he looked the phantom through and through, and marked the very texture of the folded kerchief bound about its head and chin. How now? What do you want with me? But Marley's voice, no doubt about it. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you, can you sit down? I can. Do it then. Scrooge asked the question because he didn't know whether a ghost so transparent might find himself in a condition to take a chair. But the ghost sat down on the opposite side of the fireplace as if he were quite used to it. You don't believe in me? I don't. <laughs> 
Scrooge held on tight to his chair to save himself from falling in a swoon. But how much greater was his horror when the phantom, taking off the bandage round its head as if it were too warm to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped down upon its breast. Dreadful apparition! Why do you trouble me? Bad of the worldly mind, do you believe in me or not? I, I do, I, I, I must. But why do spirits walk the earth, and why do they come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world. Oh, woe is me! And witness what it cannot share, but might have shared on earth, and turned into happiness. You are fettered. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it on of my own free will, and of my own free will I wore it. Is its pattern strange to you, or would you know the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself? It was full as heavy and as long as this seven Christmas Eves ago. You have laboured on it since. It is a ponderous chain. Scrooge glanced about him on the floor in the expectation of finding himself surrounded by some fifty or sixty fathoms of iron cable, but he could see nothing. Jacob, old Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give. He comes from other regions, Ebenezer Scrooge, and is conveyed by other ministers to other kinds of men. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Mark me! In life, my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our body changing hole. I never knew that any Christian spirit, working kindly in its little sphere, whatever it may be, will find its mortal life too short for its vast beads of usefulness. Never knew that no space of regret can make amends for one's life's opportunity misused. Yet such was I. Oh, such was I. But. You were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business, mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. It held up its chain at arm's length, as if that were the cause of all its unavailing grief, and flung it heavily upon the ground again. At this time of the rolling year, I suffer most. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate, a chance and hope of my procuring, Ebenezer. You will be haunted. By three spirits. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Couldn't I take them all at once and have it over, Jacob? Look to see me no more. And look that for your own sake, you remember what has passed between us. When it had said these words, the spectre took its wrapper from the table and bound it round its head as before. Scrooge knew this by the smart sound its teeth made when the jaws were brought together by the bandage. He ventured to raise his eyes again, and found his supernatural visitor confronting him in an erect attitude, with its chain wound over and about its arm. The apparition walked backward from him, and at every step it took, the window raised itself a little, so that when the spectre reached it, it was wide open. 
It beckoned Scrooge to approach, which he did. When they were within two paces of each other, Marley's ghost held up its hand, warning him to come no nearer. Scrooge stopped, not so much in obedience as in surprise and fear, for on the raising of the hand he became sensible of confused noises in the air, incoherent sounds of lamentation and regret, wailings inexpressibly sorrowful and self-accusatory. The spectre, after listening for a moment, joined in the mournful dirge and floated out upon the bleak, dark night. Scrooge followed to the window, desperate in his curiosity. The air was filled with phantoms, wandering hither and thither in restless haste and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. Many had been personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost in a white waistcoat with a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle, who cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman with an infant whom it saw below upon a doorstep. The misery with them all was clearly that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power forever. Whether these creatures faded into mist, or mist enshrouded them, he could not tell, but they and their spirit voices faded together, and the night became as it had been when he walked home. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked as he had locked it with his own hands, and the bolts were undisturbed. And being from the emotion he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the dull conversation of the ghost, or the lateness of the hour, oh, much in need of repose, went straight to bed and fell asleep upon the instant.